Hello everyone, today we talk about the reign of King Edgar of England um, from his ascension, essentially as a, as a core ruler to his brother uh, Edwig um, succeeded to their, their, their uncle Edward as King of England, right? And uh, there is this uh, succession right to the kingdom of the merchants from the side of Edgar that was uh, you know as um, brother of uh, the king of England as an Etling and uh, therefore as we will see now we we, we don't know how this um, succession in, in a in a part of, of the kingdom eventually had occurred with the this important split in administration we will see between the the areas uh, north and south of the Thames uh, this happened in 957, right? The Anglo-Saxon chronicler doesn't um, attribute to this uh, succession, um, you know, a big deal of, of um, relevance, let's say, in itself. While the life of Saint Dustin um, speaks of it almost as if Edgar had succeeded to the Merchant throne um, in a almost in a quasi rebellion against King Edwig, right? Supported um, in in this uh, in this rise by the what, what, what the the the, uh, the life says by the northern people, right? You know that uh, the kingdom of England existed formally, like or at least you know that this is how we have decided to 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 date such first recognition of the the the, the Anglo-Saxon unity from a couple of generations. That point. Um, so the the main tension was always between the you know the north and the south in broad terms, depending. But in general, think about Northumbria that kind of escaped more more easily. Also the east with what had been the Danelaw, etc. But also between Mercia and and Wessex uh, that had uh, nurtured during you know, the Aptarchy in general this kind of uh, different interests and competed among each other. So the word the, the various elites were. We're still kind of, uh, of course, uh, interested in maintaining an important degree of of, of autonomy, and, and uh, we suspect that the life of Saint Dustin in 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 this is, uh, however, a bit partisan, right? He does speak of what, as we will see, charters actually confirm as a sort of uh, sp of a d division of the of the kingdom along the line of the ri river Thames. Right, and as the story is uh, w was retold, also it was cast increasingly in the terms appropriate to a almost a civil war between Edgar and Edwig. Uh, Edwig was, you know, the older brother. As we'll see now, Edgar was still a kid when, uh, you know, when, when his brother uh, became king of, of England, and he succeeded also with, with to, to the Martian throne. He was very young. Probably there was a regency of some point, uh, but um, we mm, we don't see fundamentally a violent split of the kingdom or a, of a or a particular conflict existing per se. There, there was surely a, a political uh, there were some political interests that brought to this separations and areas of influence in, in a way but the unity of the kingdom was not touched in this uh, charters of Edwig issued in 957 can be shown on the basis of their witness list right to have been produced before or after the division and both Edwig and Edgar issued charters for estates in their respective kingdoms in 958 59 right so here there was an orderly separation. We immediately understand it, and we, especially in terms of ecclesiastical policy, as we will see, was particularly important when the Bene Benedictine reform that Edgar would support, etc., that seemingly said Edwig opposed, and that may be the main line of division. Uh, the um, the bishops, whose dioceses laid south of the Thames, stayed with Edwig, whereas the, the ones north um, uh, of the river uh, probably transferred to uh, to Edgar's court, right, where they would essentially lead, in fact, a different, uh, different political action, some sort, but still within 
such two neatly mm, separated and clearly separated areas. There's no evidence of, 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 uh, of war, of uh, border issues or things like that. Um, the same goes for the lay administration with the elder men, right, um, in, the, in, the, in the two areas. Um, and it is exactly such order, after all, that make us understand there probably was no revolt uh, at all, that there may have been um, essentially an agreement on the uh, separation of the spheres of influences between Edward and Edgar, um it was a probably a, uh, a a territorial division the one that occurred in 957 um in that eventually would lead to the reunion of the of, of these two areas in 959 right and apparently not much because of mm, disloyalty of of some sort but at least it's not clear right um, at that point, the unity of the English kingdom uh, was not mm, was not debated, right? It was considered as necessarily desirable for its own sake, for you know all the opportunities that could derive from you know unitary rule, um, the you know the the strength, the international strength uh, recognized. We'll see now also under Edgar um, the strength of the kingdom of England was the most power, the, the greatest power. In, in in the British Isles, and um, it is possible that this would w was a normal division occurring because of Edgar's um, m m minority, right? So that when uh, Edward had died and um, it, uh, Edwig had risen to the throne, Edgar was still seen as you know, a legitimate heir, but considering too young to to participate to government, he b there may, may have been some waiting, right, until he would come of age, and and when such split eventually would have occurred, right. And the mm, naturally in this dynamic, we we can think there might have been some uh, enmity or at least uh, uh, underlying. Conflict surely based on uh, mostly we can't even just say local uh, policies, uh, you know, autonomistic interests, rather a broader, uh, in fact, altogether English policy regarding especially certain ecclesiastical uh, issues. Um, there is also to consider the figure of the elder man Ethelstan, called the Half King. This was, was a, an important figure who interacted with five different. Uh, English rulers uh, that would, um, if not wrongly, adopt properly the same uh, the same Edgar uh, at some point. Uh, who um, at, at the rise of of, of the latter uh, resigned his office as a regent fundamentally and retired to Glastonbury. Even here, apparently without much of a problem, either you know this. Edgar's su succession had been prearranged, as we've seen within the, the broader English institutional process. Uh, either, you know, Edgar, mm, and, and it's quite likely, and, you know, th 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 there is no evidence there of kind of a, an abuse of, a, you know, superimposition of powers and so on. Um, even if uh, Ethelstan had, you know, essentially abuse of his power in a sense, and Edgar might have wanted to rise it there. You know, he, he had definitely more prerogatives and um, was kind of, you know, unfruitful to, to oppose the such such uh, such a succession uh, once Edgar would, would come of age. But there is no evidence of this in the country. We think that, you know, relations between the two were, were friendly, positive. Um, there are several charters issued in Edgar's name as King of the Merchants, suggesting that he enjoyed a complete freedom of action within his own domains. So this was not hampered by everybody and administration kept working functionally uh, throughout his Mersian rule. Um, as afterwards, where he also, as we will see, from, from which he, he would bring, you will see some some important, also some, some personnel, some administrative practices, also probably the instances of some northern men, as we'll see in the south. 
and one charger dated to 958 and still extent, uh, extent in, in its original form is attested by Edgar as quote king of the Martians and of the Northumbrians and of the Britons right so this title fundamentally reflects um, the especially the latter title the the, the uh, a, a succession uh, as to, to a major part of, of the composite wall right in this English power that was since the origins in many ways conceived properly in an imperial fashion over the British Isles and therefore was was being shared at that point with the with the actual King of England Edwig that kind of boarded the, the same title fundamentally and so here King of the Merchants of Northumbrians and so that's fundamentally the uh, the era of influence that that Edgar had um, and there are other three charters issued in 958 that are all associated with Dunstan uh, at uh, Glastonbury. You know that um, Dunstan as bishop, who is this key figure in the process of Benedictine reform in in England, uh, Edgar would be you know would catalyze this process uh, dramatically and uh, fundamentally. Uh, he was of that party himself. You know he he. He, his major um, ecclesiastical policy was supporting this process, and um, and apparently with th that had a great momentum at that point, and was naturally benefiting the political institutional development of the English kingdom, as monasteries naturally were an important landed asset. They had a uniform administration that was in fact issued a, a Winchester under Edgar's protection, and so on. And, and the sovereign was rewarded by this, as we will see. Another element that suggests a peaceful rise of Edgar to the Mercian throne is the fact that during his rule um, he essentially didn't uh, issue a separate coinage. Mm -hmm. um, his brother, you know, th this period lasted just, just a few because his brother died just after four years of reign, so that's just couple of years went after he he had uh, become ruler uh, himself so um, the it's important to stress that the Mercian mains continued to strike coins in Edwig's name throughout this period so mm, you know that this was an important prerogative for rulers there was a way you know of, of propagating one's own uh, prestige and uh, aggrandizement through the you know the, the effigies, the names, etc. The but so this this homogeneity suggests uh, first of all an agreement about such thing that is progressed because uh, even at least there there is an important recognition of the fact that yes the king was was really at at that point and that his brother wouldn't profit from a coinage on, on his own and that during during the rule um, also. Uh, the 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 while the draftmen uh, of Edwig's charters exercised a certain degree of restraint after the division of the English kingdom, in their choice of royal styles, they persisted in calling him quote king of the English, right? Um, so um, the the concept is quite clear here. Edwig remained king of a unified kingdom throughout his reign, right? Edgar was just assigned um, in an apparently subordinate role uh, the control of the northern uh, of the northern regions. So, um, of course, we don't have to think just of a purely amicable agreement where still important uh, tensions and, and uh, competitions and conflicts and so on but let's say by the mid 10th century, and also considering the fundamentally ar harmonious development of the English king from an institutional point of view, this thing was mediated and and peacefully was a positive solution for the two brothers to to, to share power with some by still maintaining uh, naturally an important preeminence over the older one, but especially the unified the united uh, character of of the kingdom itself. Right, so Edric, the old fair, it was called, died on October the first, nine hundred fifty-nine. Right, so at that point, Edgar, quote, 
um, succeeded to the kingdom both in Wessex and in Mercia and in Northumbria and he was then 16 years old yeah being quite young 14 when he rose to to power and in um, in considering his reign that l lasted from 959 to 975 um, we can see uh, an important direction taken uh, in favor of the monastic reform, right? That is arguably also the most important of Edgar policy, as far as, as we know. Um, there is a great patronage from the side of the sovereign of the monastic party, right? This is showed especially with the favor to Abingdon Abbey, in particular, under the rule of, of Edgar's mentor, who was the abbot uh, Ethelbald. This occurred, by the way, after his backing of the expulsion of priests from the ministers at Winchester and in other places in 964. Right. This is symbolized also by the Sumptuous Charter of Privileges granted at the new minister in 966. And we can witness the rising importance of, of, of abbeys, especially from the mid uh, 60s of, of the uh, of the century, from the number of um, of the same abbots attested in royal charters, because mm -hmm. they figure that's how the measure we have. The more they figure, right, and the more the more important they are politically. And that's when, at the Synodal Council of Winchester, the um, Regularis Concordia was established. Um, uh, there um, rewarded the king right that had encouraged and support actively uh, the, the monks uh, to to summon the same the same council and also coordinating their efforts because the Winchester council as, uh, as we were saying before was the the most important uh, event in the in the English Benedictine reform as fundamentally not just because of the, the, the extensive, extensive introduction such monastic element that would in fact confer to the English church this kind of uh, peculiar nature, right? More, much more monastic oriented than the, the Roman model. Um, but also provided a uniformity in ecclesiastical administration in the whole kingdom of England accordingly. And this naturally was very mm, positive for strengthening uh, the uh, the royal rule uh, in in the country right and uh, this was a way essentially for the sovereign to control important assets to monastic foundations that would thus maintain their own prerogatives granted by the king and increase their power and therefore increasing their their uh, essentially th th their prestige among the population and increasing c the control of, of, of the kingdom o o on the same subject and in fact um, propagandistically Edgar received a great deal of support from the uh, direct or indirect beneficiaries of his policy which included Ethelwald, Landfred of Winchester, Wolfstan of Winchester, Elfric, um, Bertfert of Ramsey and it's obvious, therefore, in Edgar's policy that the monastic party had been beside his um, his rule quite f from an early time, right? The aforementioned split of the kingdom may have actually occurred um, in on the basis of such um, of, of of such pattern, right? That um, the the north, let's say, was more favorable to, s to such reform probably to um, I, I don't know I presume because you know that it was already spread in, in the air more than in the south but that, that this kind of unifying cling factor could have at that point also um, given the opportunity to the kingdom let's say to unify over the same preeminence of, of for example of Wessex uh, over the north or, s or something so in a way that uh, through which the, the same north could could interfere or could, could you know, have a, a greater, let's say, weight in the political decisions uh, of the kingdom than it would have been otherwise. 
and um, there ha there has been some kind of negative press figuratively towards Edgar at this point because there is one source for example that says quoted loved evil foreign customs and brought to firmly heathen manners within his, this land and attracted hither foreigners and enticed harmful people to his country now um, we don't even know what, what this means but I presume this has to do with the general this general novelty that had been introduced and also po and possibly the uh, what normally kings do in this regard that is to say in order to counter further the power of the uh, of the aristocracy like introducing uh, I don't know some foreign personnel um, that would fuel the, you know the, the bureaucracy the administration even the army for that matter with mercenaries and so on and we, we just we just don't know which however points in the direction of this further uh, centralization right and in fact, Edgar appears also in the sources of the time as the king that had managed, um, whereas all his mm, predecessors had failed in, in the same way, in suppressing the uh, wrongdoing, essentially maintaining public order, right? So ruling more or less with iron fist, um, and uh, which is definitely, you know, especially in that time, a positive, very positive affirmation of public authority. Whereas most people just like like to keep doing wh whatever they want to do without much of control, so that Edgar's reign passed for you know a, a peace, a peaceful, or if you better think about it, a um, pacified one, right? Uh, how was this achieved? Um, well, we can look at, at Edgar's charters and law codes. Um, the um, when Edgar became king. Of all England in 959, um, he um, brought with with him what uh, in modern scholarship is called Edgar A. That is essentially a scribe that had worked for him as uh, when he was king of, of the Mercians, and who was entrusted with the responsibility for the production of the majorities of the king's charters in the early uh, uh, nine sixties, bringing thus to an important level of uniformity and to the establishment of certain practices in, in setting the pattern for, for the rest of Edgar's reign, right? So much that, in fact, in the following decades, these documents are very, uh, very uniform in structure, content, which also suggests that probably Edgar's reign didn't quite see much of a political change in, in um, let's say, in formally speaking, but rather in the enforcements of, of the practice, right? There were some, you know, new new laws, of course, but um, the the matter here was more importantly keeping together what, what already existed in the way it was already uh, ruled, for instance, but traditionally. And um, there is an important change uh, witness from the late 1960s charters um, regarding the northern provinces and the fact that uh, there are in such documents um, more mm, more references to mm, important elder men from the area most notably the, the person of Oslak right also in, in the early 19s uh, 1970s um, the uh, secular hierarchy as a wall came to be dominated by four great men, right? That were Elfair of Mercia, Edelwine of East Anglia, Oslak of Northumbria, and um, Beardsnoth of Essex. So this suggests uh, actually an ol oligarchization of power through these direct, uh, th this, yeah, this, this mm, king's men in a sense that were already powerful, even in their own in their own lands, but that were uh, more co-opted, kind of integrated to the government at the expense of, of other aristocrats to control better this this lands. We, we don't, however, know um, anything practically about the, the relation between these men and the king, but also the and, and also the, the, the relative chunks of the kingdom that they ruled uh, on, or at least they were preeminent on 
and nor about the local administration of the same areas throughout the same time and um, so um, and, and of, of England in general at that point so mm, we uh, we can mostly see particular ar ar arrangements uh, that occurred in, in the heartland of Wessex itself so probably at the core of, of center power right so um, none of the 10th century Anglo-Saxon kings ever you know uh, approached uh, again the grandeur and aim of uh, Alfred uh, the great um, and uh, in part also because this you know the situation was different of course and the, the thing was made uh, in many ways as the, the kingdom was working um, that there is, uh, however, in Edgar's case, an important emphasis on the administration, right, rather than on the law uh, per se. Right, the primary concern of the king was to fluidify the uh, procedures, um, not to introduce new ones themselves, as we were saying before. Um, and this suggests naturally that such uh, laws had not been observed quite in, the, in, in as they, they should have been uh, and we can track more or less when things had uh, started going wrong uh, on the meter of evaluation but uh, it's still remarkable because it naturally talks for for, for, for about an energic attempt to reinforce the law as such, which is, is an important thing by, by sovereign. Mm, for example, in one of these laws, every man was to provide himself with a surety, right, who would hold him to every legal duty. Hundred courts, boroughs, cor uh, borough courts and shire courts were to be convened on a regular basis, so increasing kind of local administrative capacities. All transitions were to take place in the presence of appointed witnesses, yet another quite uh, fundamental mm, uh, mm, procedure, right? In in any in any kind of law at the time, right? Also, uh, there was an increased pursuing of the delinquents, right? Uh, which is almost r relentless. This naturally doesn't speak in gen generally. You know that the, the Kingdom of England went throughout a you know, through the 10th, the, the, the 11th century, through a form of, of gradual prioritization, right? So the the efforts of the rulers were ever more, let's say, the Kingdom of England was one of those um, uh, countries in Europe that had worked better in terms of, of unitary capacity. At least it had evolved around that path. It, had, it was something started being built from from the bottom up, right? So um, there, even though this this had mirrored a sur surpassing of a of a privatization in the beginning then events later on were being to because about the Danish domination all these things uh, to the introduction of different models from from the English one mostly also Danish ones so um, there is the idea that the the anglo-saxon administrative structures at some point were kind of mm, degenerating declining right even if some broader you know, of course, uh, model r remained right till the the Norman conquest and beyond. By the way, but the the functionality of it, right, it at some point kind of fell out, because it was obvious in such circumstances that without a progressed strong central power, etc., uh, this effort had been important, right? The idea of compacting the country, but at the same time, there was no greater force outside effect of the same monarchy that uh, was also, as we have seen. Uh, availing itself of some uh, private aid and so on to uh, to just uh, arrange a, a system of such complexity for which everything would regularly go towards a completely positive and uh, improved uh, you know an improvement that you know would fix all, all the issues right so Edgar's reign is uh, and, and po policy and government is 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 debated because of course we know a few of it and we get this um, positive feed mostly from the, the pro-Benedictine party historiography. The um, probably fr from 
what was registered at the time that Edgar was uh, right uh, an energetic ruler in, in these fields of administration, trying to properly making things uh, right and punishing also violently uh, the the criminals. Those who you know uh, went here, we don't have to think just about I mean, the common criminal, but whoever wouldn't actually try to would would escape from the the institutional mechanism through the legal mechanisms in general which were very often you know the most powerful right um and those names we we've said before were probably the agents of such change it is to say in their own respective milieu they would suppress uh, also important uh, autonomistic initiatives or privatistic initiatives from the side of other you know other i don't know elder men other noblemen etc and at some point, Edgar says, quote, that uh, insisting on the enforcement of the provisions, quote, which I and my counselors have added to the decrees of my ancestors from the benefit of all the nation. And um, let's say, uh, so this this is something that goes beyond just law making, right? And what we can draw from there. Lanfred of Winchester wrote in the 70s, of the century, credited Edgar with the introduction of, quote, a law of great severity, right, whereby convicted felons were to be blinded, mutilated, sculpted, their bodies thrown out to wild beasts and birds, so things that definitely weren't particularly, you know, uh, f tender and sweet against those who would disobey. Um, for this reason, um, some sources hailed Edgar as, quote, the strongest of all kings over the English nation, right? The idea that this guy had come to rule with, you know, kind of even ferocious means to ensure such such uh, legality, suppressing evildoers everywhere, uh, subduing tyrants, so properly stressing the fact that, of course, England was full of, uh, was still, a, you know, full of, of, of lords, of, 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 of kind of autonomous private powers that were trying to do whatever they wanted, in a way, um, and that were naturally always a threat for the same stability of the kingdom, right? So this allegedly brought a, a great peace, according to the historiographers of the time. Um, and the and Edgar naturally was the author of it for for his people. Mm -hmm. And there is therefore more than a than a decade of Edgar's peace enforced on, on the Kingdom of England, which appeared as a wall that was reinforced as such. Right? We don't we have no evidence of, you know, somebody having some centrifugal force, some secession, whatever. Right? We've seen that the same Edgar if he had had to be the the, the, the guy who had ruled in parallel to, to his um uh, king brother, you know, would have uh, uh would have pushed for those things and actually especially you know uh, collecting the the uh, the northern instances and said you know it was a broader project and broader vision and understanding that of course the English unity had to be reinforced through the law through also these harsh means right um, and as we were saying before the, the council of Winchester was very important in, in here because it was said um, that the king in, the, in this occasion urged his bishops and abbots and abbesses quote, to be of one mind as regards monastic usage less different ways of observing the customs of one rule and one country should bring their holy conversation into disrepute so the objective there is quite clear and um, there is just a uh, the same in King Edgar's great reform of coinage around 973, uh, which was, as we were saying before, an important means to assert a, a sovereign government at the time, and which entailed, in fact, an important standardization of the currency um, that was reflected by the uh, you know, the, the work of mints throughout the whole country. And um, the kingdom in itself was remade in the process, 
right? And that was a way to properly show the, also the wealth, the, the precious metals availability, all these things, and the the capacity of the English government and administration making uh, so the, the means functioning all over the territory. Another important ideological and legitimizing move of Edgar was essentially a second um, anointing that he received because when he accessed in 959 he had already been mm, as it was in usage anointed and crowned however again in on May the 11th with Sunday 973 in the Roman city of Bath Edgar was consecrated essentially a second time as far as we understand um, and immediately afterwards he took his fleet to Chester where he received the submission of mm, some Welsh and Scottish rulers so this event is and, and the combination of the two things especially the uh, the anointing and the, the, the military uh, show off rather than expedition itself was showing there in fact the, the English power and the capacity of reaff you know of affirming uh, this you know hegemonic rule over the British Isles uh, in part ideally but still as from the from the standpoint of the strongest uh, British power is of course uh, reinforced in the um, in the new appointment as a, to, to the role of a Christian king, right? This celebration in public display of the English supremacy all over Britain. At that time, Edgar was 29 years old at, at the zenith of his power, right? And um, However things went, because people say, you know, but the fact, again, that he had to affirm, to use such violent means to affirm his rule is maybe actually the other way around, that, that uh, this rule was perturbed in a way, or at least that it was, well, of course, at a 10th century Anglo-Saxon king, it's not that, you know, was just sitting there saying, ah, finally, I'm a king, I can have fun now. Well, of course, uh, all things were, um, were very complex, difficult, etc., but he, he operated in, in a positive direction as far as we see um, there aren't any you know essentially uh, disruptive uh, mm, you know events that bring us to say you know that, that after all this was kind of a, uh, of a propaganda that, that the, the, the kingdom was falling apart no there is not such a thing and Edgar's strength in this sense is witnessed also when the fact that when he died on July the 8th, 975, the peace of his kingdom was immediately disturbed. Right? And that's another story, but um, for another video. But it's still meaningful that um, uh, the Edwig, Edgar's, and uh, their same uncles, you know, uh, uh, succession, say, had occurred with such, uh, after all, successful mediation hmm? Along the uh, within the English balance of power, the mm, the success in affirming the Benedictine reform, the important coinage reform of Edgar, and also the important display of uh, his own uh, sacrality as a king, the the, the unity of his kingdom and the also the international recognition of the saint it was probably also supported by some kind of international relations that just here we can't trace but that surely at this point were, were part of the political uh, thermometer right that could and that maybe somebody was not happy of in England itself but uh, still that that's the point right in order for a power to, to, to rise to consolidate it has to to pass over somebody in a way or in another to the broader benefit and the reasons of why this happens and naturally there is always somebody who withstands such uh, such uh, such uh, effort and but uh, you know for which reason right because again uh, the kingdom at that point was not in discussion in itself right and was not to be so 
for now we stop it here uh, uh, today I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye